So welcome to Tripod, our travel retail themed podcast series in association with the SIVA Group. I'm Martin Moody. I'm Roger Jackson. Roger, looking around our industry at the moment, we're seeing brighter and brighter signs. Still some question marks, of course, over China, but elsewhere the world is getting back to something like normal. Lots and lots of people on the move. I've seen it as I've traveled through numerous airports in recent weeks. I saw today a note from Forward Keys, the analyst saying that global traffic in Q3 is gonna reach around 65% of 2019 levels. Now 65 is not 100, but it's a heck of a lot closer than some of the percentages we've been talking about on this very program in recent months. How are you seeing the, the state of the travel retail nation? I think that report is great to hear. Um, and it's a global report, which is great because we've seen that sort of level in certain regions, Middle East as I think it's fair to say has led the way, uh, domestic travel in the US um, and some domestic travel in Europe as well. But to hear 65%, I think is, is really positive. I think the news story behind the story is basket spend as well, Martin. So I think if you spoke to most retailers, I heard Ramesh Sadambi yesterday actually on the Medfa um, uh, on the Medfa talk, and he spoke about basket size. And whilst we've seen that fall back from let's say pandemic levels, where I think people were just desperate to shop and you know bought because they had the opportunity to. We've still seen it basket spend above uh, 2019 levels. So I think a mixture of that slowly increasing passenger number, and it is now slowly increasing, it's 65, it's 66, it's 67. And I think it'll be a slow path back, yeah. um, given the fact uh, we've got no China uh, in those numbers pretty much. Um, I think, and then we've still got the larger basket spend. I think it's really healthy for our industry. And we all know, I think if you speak to most retailers or most brand owners, we're pretty much planning for no Chinese passengers in 2023. And if you are, you're probably looking towards the end of 2023, start of 2024. So the good news is, I think that's pretty much built into everyone's numbers already, Martin. So I see it as very positive, uh, very incremental uh, and great for the industry, actually. Yeah, no, that's great news. And if the, if the Chinese revival, as it were, comes a little earlier, that'll be icing on at least um, a sizable cake. Well, there's one business that did very well, Roger, during the pandemic, a very rare example of a, of a travel, retail and duty-free business that's grown. And we're about to talk to the man who heads that, a remarkable character, you know him well, I know him very well, and we're going to talk to him not just about business, but about some very important social and corporate responsibility principles that he holds dear. Shall we bring in a very yeah, special guest? Yeah, let's get him in, Martin. So this episode's special guest, I'm delighted to say, is Patrick Doyle, the Dubai-based founder and chief executive of International Diplomatic Supplies, IDS. Well, what a remarkable entrepreneur's tale this is. It's the story of an enterprise that was founded in the bedroom of Patrick's London home some 25 years ago. The company, in fact, just celebrated that landmark in Dubai at an event both Roger and I were privileged to attend, a fantastic evening. And IDS has subsequently risen to become the global market leader in the diplomatic supply channel with its head office in Dubai and affiliates in numerous geographic locations. Now, the Dubai celebration not only marked the company's commercial success, but it also highlighted Patrick's impressive principles and extraordinary achievements, I think, as a philanthropist, supporting various children's charities around the world. I'm not gonna dwell on those now. I'm sure Patrick is gonna talk with his trademark passion around them today. This willingness to share the benefits of IDS's commercial success with many who are less fortunate in our world lies at the base of the company's ethos and its development and its great, great success. A most remarkable man. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 
Mr. Patrick Doyle. Patrick, welcome to Tripod. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and it's always a pleasure to talk to Roger, who uh, we do a lot of business with, and I have a fantastic relationship with. So um, great to see you guys. Uh, great to see you, Roger. I'll let you you kick off. You're both both in Dubai. You do see each other regularly, as uh, as Patrick said. So um, I know you're taking particular pleasure in having Patrick as our guest. I am, and Patrick, uh, great to see you today. Um, we always start off where it all began, and um, I do know your story, so I'm itching for everyone who listens to this to hear your story. Could you just give us, take us back to sort of day one, growing up, you know, for you, the moves, uh, you know, physically as a child, uh, and influences, and just a bit around that family background of what, you know, started you off in life? Yes. Um, so my, um, I was born in Dublin, um, and I, I sort of only worked out in in the last few years that my father didn't have a permanent job until he was forty three, which was was when we moved to England. Um, in the winter, he would deliver coal on the back of a, with a horse and cart, and in the summer, he worked on the roads. And each season he'd be let go because they're no longer needed. And then he'd have to go back to looking for a job for the next season. So um, I was too young to really appreciate quite that, what that meant. But I know now that you know, my mum had a choice between eating herself and feeding the children. And obviously she, she chose the children. Um, so different, yeah, people are in much worse positions than we were, but uh, quite difficult time we moved to England and it's almost a funny story now we moved to my grandmother's one bedroom apartment where she lived with my aunt my uncle and my uncle's friend and seven of us my, my mother and father my four sisters and me turned up and we just were put down wherever we could sleep and slept on the floor with a pillow and a sleeping bag well, I, I don't know how long that went on, but eventually we moved into a into a flat and apartment backing onto the railway until that building was condemned. Um, and then we moved and, and eventually we, we uh, bought our own house. My mum worked very hard. My dad worked very hard, but didn't earn a huge amount of money. But um, my mum worked very hard and the family got more established and obviously free education and healthcare give us opportunities that many around the world ultimately don't have. Um, how did, I guess, how do you feel that that shaped you now without going too far into the future? Because that is a pretty, you know, versus me, I guess I've had a bit more of a conventional bringing, albeit working class. How do you feel that sort of, you know, impacted you now and later on in your life? Um, I'm, I'm mentally tough. Um, is that from those experiences? I, I don't know. Um, but I'm mentally tough. I, I, I approach everything as I expect to win. I have a very much a winning mentality. Uh, when my team get together, when we come under pressure in any market or, or from a competitor, uh, I, with all honesty, I approach it that let them worry because we are not going to lose. And um, I bring out the best in my team with my self-belief. And I think that comes from a resilience. Uh, well, uh, during that time when we first moved to London, there was a gas leak in where we were sleeping. And um, I could have died that night. I was out, taken out onto the street and coughing and spluttering and then taken to the hospital. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, I make it, it sounds worse saying it all in one bit, but childhood was fine. I played football and I went to Crystal to watch Crystal Palace and um, I, I learned some things at school sometimes, but it wasn't my main focus with going to school, uh, playing football was. Right. But yes, uh, I got a mental toughness, I think. And then you started your career. 
So as in terms of your first role, uh, James Borough, Kingsburn, International, could you just give us a bit of uh, how did that come about before you obviously then ended up in um, in your bedroom starting idea? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, yes. Um, I went to a school in South London and it was during Thatcher's uh, recession. So... Uh, big unemployment issues, miners' strike around that sort of time. Um, so getting a job as a as a young person was going to be difficult. And I remember a very supportive comment from the deputy head of my school saying, nobody's ever going to employ you, so why you bother going for interviews? Oh. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, but I got a job at Beefeater Gin, James oh. Burroughs as a messenger um, in the export department. So taking bills of lading up to shipping lines and picking documents up from the Chamber of Commerce and bringing them back to Kennington. Um, I worked harder than anyone else would do. I had a really positive personality. I wasn't good at school. I, was, I left school at 16 with very poor uh, Cs and a B, three Cs and a B in my, what was then O-levels. Um, but when I went to school, when I went to work, something changed in me and I had a great work ethic. They moved me into the office and made me an export trainee in the shipping department. And I would go in at weekends and, and didn't announce that, but I was doing other people's work. There were two guys in their mid to late, mid 60s coming up for retirement, huge experience, but they wanted to go on uh, boozy business lunches as often as they could. Uh, so they taught me their work and I did their work and I was happy, I was learning. They were very, very knowledgeable. So I got good experience and they got to have their boozy lunches and everyone was a winner. So uh, I had a great time at Beefeater. I'm still loyal to the brand, although I don't drink alcohol, but we're having the opportunity to sell. Um, and then uh, I moved on from there to uh, Longrow. Um, for anybody younger than me, Longrow was a huge company. They owned Harrods during my time there. They, used, they owned uh, Land Rover cars, and they were the biggest employer in Africa. So I was employed in the shipping department uh, for their gold mine, Ashanti gold fields in Ghana, in West Africa. And I think I was 19 by then, really enjoyed that company. Uh, at the time, uh, the, the prime minister, Ted Heath, at the time had described Lomro as the unacceptable face of capitalism, <laughs> which is a, you know, I'm still a socialist. I, I, I do my socialism in a different way, but I was much more so then. Yeah. Uh, so to go and join the unacceptable face of capitalism was kind of amusing. Yeah. Um, and again, worked very hard, worked very long hours. And when I was 21, they made me shipping manager. Had a staff of about 10 people. Um, they sent me out to Ghana, to the mine, which was... Um, Again, I, I was probably 23, 24 by then. Um, and I'd only been on a plane for the first time when I was 17. So going out to Africa and going underground in a mine, I went, and went on a safety check with one of the mine captains, visited the ports, visited uh, container ships. I, I just loved it. Um, while I was there, uh, I was playing football for the management of the mine against miners. I nearly caused a riot by fouling the centre forward from the miners team and a thousand miners ran onto the pitch <laughs> heading for me. Um, but afterwards in the bar, uh, a gentleman called Keith McKenna, who was the chairman and, and founder of King's Barn, um, had a chat with me. Uh, ultimately invited me for lunch back in London and offered me a job as export manager in his company. So then I, I was 24 when I joined them. And um, Keith had been an airline pilot for British Caledonian, and he was carrying smoked salmon and cheeses in his suitcase 
around Africa and selling or selling to the British ambassador or to the head of the bank or whoever he may have made contact with and was getting different requests for more and more. So he gave up being a pilot and set up King's Barn as really that first taste of home for expats and um, British embassies. So I, that's how I got into this field. I enjoyed working with Keith. He was quite a character. Uh, he then had some health problems and retired. And uh, over the years, I've, I've grown. I set up a drinks company within King's Barn called King's Cellars. And um, after I think I'd been with them about 18 months, they gave me 10% of the company and they made me a director. So that was a nice leap from the grandmother's one bedroom apartment. Um, so worked for King's Barn for nine years. Um, and one day I got back from, I, I was back from a trip to Morocco and the managing director came into my office and said at 10 in the morning and said, I've got nothing to do, I'm off to play golf. And I was so busy. I just got back from a trip. I had loads of follow-up to do. I was planning another trip. And I just sat for a little while at my desk and thought, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm gonna set up on my own. I took my car to the supermarket car park with my little telephone book and I phoned the suppliers and said, if I set up on my own, would they give me credit? And everybody agreed that they would. Um, and then I began the process of, of starting IDS. Mm. Uh, within days, I realized that I couldn't be planning to leave and still be making decisions for the company that I was working for. I wanted to be ready to set up before I resigned and, and left. But within probably two or three days, I had a decision to make and I, I couldn't. So I went to the managing director and said, I'm leaving and I'm setting up on my own. Um, within half an hour, I was being escorted off the premises, and, um, which was all fine. I, I completely ex I expected that. Yeah. And back in my three bedroom semi in uh, South London, I painted the walls of the room in two tones of green, which were the original colors of the IDS, first IDS brochure. I got a second hand desk filing cabinet and chair. And I'd never used, the internet was, I think started in 95 and this was 97. So I'd never used the internet. I'd never used email. I'd certainly never done a VAT return. That was my, <laughs> that was my biggest early challenge. Yeah. And uh, I, got a, I got a website set up for, for IDS from the beginning, produced the catalog, working with my existing suppliers. And then um, 6th of May, 1997, I sat down behind the desk and, and started making the first contact with customers. Um, one that I always recall is calling the British High Commission in New Delhi. And the guy who answered the phone, whose name was Grant, and he was a New Zealander. And he, uh, I said, this company, IDS, we supply duty-free goods to diplomats. Um, and he said, that's fantastic, because Her Majesty the Queen is coming to India for the 50th anniversary of Indian independence, and we will need a supplier. And I said, oh, well, then you'll need Malvern Spring Water and um, Cloudy Bay Sauvignon Blanc. And he said, oh, you know about these things. I said, I have some experience. Oh. Completely made it up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sent him the brochure. And the British High Commission placed a very big order. He then called to say, I hope you don't mind, but I've recommended you to the Canadian, Australian and New Zealand associations who buy together. And the British Embassy, the British High Commission in Islamabad who all placed orders. So then I was on the phone telling missions in Jeddah and Cairo and Kingston, Jamaica. Of course, we're supplying Her Majesty's visit to India for the 50th anniversary of independence. And, and this just grew the thing. Uh, Lagos, I went to Lagos. Um, a friend of mine, Gavin Caldwell, was who I played football with, 
years earlier was now at the British High Commission in Lagos. So I went to stay with him and met some embassies. And we just grew quite well, quite quickly. The, um, Martin and I discussed a, a legend of the UK duty-free uh, scene, John Sankey. Um, and I, I knew John Sankey quite well by mm. that point. And John gave us warehousing from the beginning and was always very supportive and uh, quite liked every, like, like many people in the industry, I got a Christmas card from John every year and always noted how he's followed my career and the success of IDS. And yeah, that meant a lot because he, he was a very respected figure, sadly passed away now. Mm. So we set up and um, it, it grew quite nicely. And then I had the ridiculously ridiculous idea to start supplying the foreign embassies in London. And I thought, well, if we can deliver to Nigeria and Pakistan, we can deliver to London. I did a business plan that they would sell a million pounds worth of goods and the margin would be this. And, but never in my calculations that I take on board that to do a next day delivery service, you needed enough of every product you list, which was about a thousand products, to be able to fulfill the needs of multiple embassies on a daily basis and be efficient. It didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even think about it until I, I, I bought some products and then the orders started pouring in. It was, it was successful quickly. And I was, I was processing, so in, in the mornings I'd get into the office very early and I'd process the orders. And then I went into London to visit the embassies and then I'd come back and finish the day or maybe go to a diplomatic reception in the evening. So I was working from about five in the morning off until about 11 at night. Um, and, and the money was just like, it was ridiculous. But um, my bank manager at Barclays, banking prior to the 2007, 2008 crisis was much easier. It was much more relationship based. And the bank manager came to my house and I told him why and what I needed and that I hadn't made a proper plan, but I had the success. And he said, how much would you like? Um, so organized an unsecured overdraft with Barclays and um, was able to reposition the business to be a London supplier and continue with the growth of exports. So we carried on growth, organic growth, small percentages year on year, and it was fine. And then um, in, at the end of 2001, the war in Afghanistan started and we had the embassies in particularly Pakistan, Islamabad, had placed their orders and by now we were supplying the British, the Americans, the Canadians and, and about 12 or 13 smaller missions. And they had all placed their Christmas orders and I had bought the stock. But then everybody pulled out their non-essential staff and families. Um, so they canceled their orders because they didn't know what the next phase was going to be of this uh, invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, so I was left with a load of stock. These orders were, say, £50,000, $70,000 from any given embassy. So I had the stock and I didn't have a sale for it. Um, then got into the beginning of uh, 20, uh, 2002. And... Uh, I had to pay for the stock, but I hadn't sold it and I was still sitting on it. I was trying to push it out into London, but the, the market for exports was very different to the London sales. Yep. And the, the business went into a decline from the beginning of 2002 until 2005. And as I kind of described, my career from starting work at 16 had been entirely upwardly mobile. And I was now 30, 
35, 36, 37, and my son was born, I was 38. Um, and I had nothing to help me deal with failure. I, I just, um, the gray hair came in that time. Um, working long hours, not getting a salary, because it was, it, it just had this ongoing negative effect on the business that we, we really struggled to come out of for some time. And in the beginning of 2005, I made contact with a chap called Alf Allington, who is the managing director and part owner of London City Bond, which was by now our third party provider of logistics and bonded warehouse in London. Uh, at the time we owed London City Bond about 90,000 pounds, which was quite a lot for us in, in those days. And said to Alf, look, I just can't get the business off the ground. We have a turnover of about two and a half million dollars. We either lose 10,000 or make 10,000 in a year, but it's, not, it's just not going anywhere. My career is stagnating. Would the people who invest in London City Bond invest in IDS and try to take the business to another level? And a week later, Alf called me and said, uh, we don't invest in our customers, but I hope you don't mind. I've passed your, your details on to John Coe of Coe Vintners, Coe of Ilford, yep. and he wants to meet you. So I met with John and that was the turning point for our business. I, I wrote an article for a, a magazine in London a few years ago and said money changes everything. Well, money certainly changed everything. John was a great mentor and, and great support to me, but having the funds to grow the business and giving me my career back and my, my debt to John, not financial debt, but that he'd, he'd uh, supported me, gave me such huge energy and we, we rapidly turned the business around. I, I was now traveling. I hadn't traveled since my trip to Lagos in 97. By 2005, I hadn't made another overseas trip to grow the business. Yeah. It, it had been organic growth. Um, 2007, John called me and said, could we do anything in Dubai? And I said, I don't think so. I, I imagine it's fairly established as a market and put the phone down and I thought, Let's go and see if we can do something in Dubai. So I made a couple of calls and I ended up being put in touch with Mark Rogers. Um, Mark has a company called Intergulf, which, which we are now merged with. Yeah. Um, and he was supplying through the duopoly in Dubai, African and Eastern and MMI. Mark was supplying wines into the hotels and bars as Dubai had grown and grown and grown, the two companies uh, I'll say they, they couldn't keep up with the growth. I don't know if that's a fact, but they were using Mark to have a diversity of wine um, and other products, and he built a nice business on the back of it. So we started talking about uh, starting a business to have, we had complementary but non-competing businesses in the drinks industry. So we could sell Mark's wines and he could store here, yeah, Intergulf have a liquor license, they can store and distribute uh, for export um, alcohol from, from Jebel Ali. Um, and over time, we got closer and closer together. And ultimately in 2013, we merged the two companies and Mark is now managing director of IDS in all of its forms um, and is really a fantastic managing director. He's, it's a great partnership because He's got skills that I don't have, and I, and I guess I've got skills that he doesn't have, or he's too busy with the ones he does have. But it's worked fantastically well, and John remains in the background as a very important part of who we are. So does that answer your question? It, it, it answers it particularly well. I think I'm, I'm yeah. always fascinated to hear entrepreneurs' stories because... Of course, people come along when you reach 25, Patrick, and they see the glittering occasion and they see the success you have. What they don't so often see is all those hard yards that go in, all the pain, all the blood, the sweat and the tears that every entrepreneur, and, and I speak as one, um, knows of. Those moments of crises that can make or 
break you? And you've talked about one that I didn't know that nearly tipped you the wrong way. And then other traits that you see with entrepreneurs, luck, a little bit of luck. You met the right person at the right time. And there was, a, there was an introduction that obviously helped you. So, I mean, I think lots of insightful anecdotes that have married with your own character and your own resilience and your own ability to get you to where um, you are today. But it's been one heck of a journey, hasn't it? More ups and downs, but those downs were were pretty formative, I, I, I suspect, to the success that IDS is today. Yes, I, I borrowed every penny I could get. I borrowed against my house to so there was no equity left yep. in the house. Um, but I believed in myself. And I think for anybody thinking of starting a business, self-belief is a massive thing. Not going down a blind alley, but weighing up the odds of success and failure. No. And if you believe in yourself enough to start a business, and continue to believe in yourself. And that was my greatest strength, that I wasn't going to give up. I'm, I'm driven by service. And I know that the IDS service to the diplomatic hall, which is now a wide group of customers, is the best in the world because I demand excellent service. And I had that at a million pound turnover and I've got it at 40 million pound turnover. It's It's the key we don't make the products that we sell we deliver them from a to b so do it well and do it on time and do it consistently well and on time and at a fair price yeah um so that's what we did but there were times that i sat on the end of my bed crying um when i didn't have a salary for three four months and um yeah but it's been worth it absolutely it's been worth it great roger I think uh, Patrick's actually answered all of my questions, Martin, in one <laughs> which, which he, he, he just made me redundant. Um, but um, I, I guess it just, it's probably more of a personal question, um, but considering I've got you, Patrick, I'll ask, I'll ask it. How many times were you close to, you know, closing it all in and as, as a, a fellow entrepreneur, go and get a normal job? As um, as people tell me that perhaps I should someday, um, how many times were you really close to throwing it in? Never. N never once. Never once. Never once. Um, dig deeper and dig deeper. And when you think you can't dig deeper, get another shovel and dig deeper. Never once. Good. So don't do it, Roger. Anyway, you're a super success, Roger. So, yeah, that, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure about that. But come and see me in 22 years. It when I've uh, if I if I get to 25 years, Patrick. So you will. Well, let's move on from business per se, isolated to values that underpin the business, Patrick. I referred to them in my introduction. You've done some extraordinary work as a company, as an individual, and as a family um, for the dispossessed, the, um, the unprivileged of the world. Tell us, about, tell us about your principles, why they matter so much to you, and, and how, you, how you go about building your, your own very individualistic version of a, of a CSR program. Yes. Um, I don't think of it as a CSR program. Uh, it, it's uh, not three letters that are in my vocabulary. I just don't. It's, I have a business that's reasonably successful yeah. and a business that pays me quite well, really, for what I do. Um, and therefore, we're in a position to do something. Roger sent me a message, a uh, private message, a few months ago, uh, saying, well done for something that we did. And I replied, I don't know whether you remember, Roger, I replied to say, I'm at war with unfairness. 
and that is me. Um, there's a lot of unfairness in the world, and there's a lot of excessive wealth. And if we brought those two things together just a little bit better, the world could just change. It's so, so achievable if everybody puts their mind to it. Um, our, our story with that started, um, I was invited to, no, I was asked to support an event in Khartoum to raise funds for a British children's charity called Kids for Kids. Yeah. And we, we said, yes, we will give some goods and support the event. And then as it came closer, I said, I'll come for the event. And when I got there, uh, they said, we've got these pictures of like uh, Nubian warrior type South Sudanese, I think they were mainly, but fabulous, colorful pictures of powerful African warriors, photographs um, that they were auctioning. They had them framed in their auctioning. And if you put me, if you give me a microphone, I think I'm funny. Um, so they gave me a microphone and, and I, I said, I'll be the auctioneer. Okay. And we got ridiculously high amounts for these pictures. I couldn't believe it. And I don't know whether I was funny, but we, we made money. And when I got back to the UK, uh, the founder of, of Kids for Kids is a remarkable woman called Patricia Parker. Um, her son is currently British ambassador to Albania. And he was stationed at the British Embassy in Khartoum, and they went out on a trip to Darfur. And on the way, Patricia saw what turned out to be a nine-year-old boy out in the middle of the desert on his own. And he was walking, and he walked, I may get the details wrong, but he walked seven hours each day with jerry cans to collect water from for his family. Yeah. And Patricia was furious because like me, that's her, that's her nature when she sees unfairness. Um, and that, that was 21 years ago. And she came back and started Kids for Kids, which is kids being baby goats or kids being children. And the scheme started as giving families a herd of six goats. They build a, a bigger herd and then they pass six goats on to another family and then another family, another family and so on and so on. And everyone who receives then passes on. That's now in about a hundred villages in Darfur and has expanded into um, kindergartens, medical centers, paravets, donkeys, um, water, water being massive. So um, Erica and I, my wife and I, funded a water pump in a village that the three villages all come to because there is so much water coming from that. Uh, there's an aquifer under Darfur that can yeah. only be uh, accessed with, with water pumps. So um, I got back to the UK after, after Darfur and Patricia invited me to their Christmas concert and came a caveat with the invitation would you uh, would IDS provide the wines free of charge for the Christmas concert? Of course, I said yes. I then went and I met Patricia for the first time, and she is a an angel, a, a fabulous person, and she has devoted the last twenty one years of her life to looking after the children of Darfur. And uh, I'm privileged to have been part of that for I think about twelve or thirteen years. Yeah. Patricia asked me to be a trustee of the charity. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, when she speaks about the children in Darfur, it has a Pavlov's dog effect on my wallet. And I just have to do something. Yeah. So meeting Patricia was the beginning, really, of me wanting to do something. Um, I took what she had and then I turned it into my own and we've done different things. Uh, so IDS support gentle hands and orphanage in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, 
before our board meeting in Dubai, I think it was 2018, um, I, the, the board agreed that we should do something for a charity. So I, I sat at my laptop looking for inspiration. We, we have a lot of Filipino staff, as many companies in the UAE and the GCC have. Yeah. And so I thought I, I want to do something with the Philippines. And I found the website of Gentle Hands and it had this poem prayer uh, written, I think by Charity Graf, who, who runs the charity. And it was just so moving. It was about what they call the foundlings, children who are maybe two or three years old, who are left at the side of the road. Yeah. Yeah. How can that be? How can that be? Yeah. Um, how can that be? Yeah. So I printed that off. I was crying at my laptop. Um, I printed that prayer poem off and we had a meeting with all the team and I gave everybody a copy. And we decided the first thing we would do is pay for homeschooling for the foundlings because they didn't speak an, a language. They didn't necessarily know their name when they came into the orphanage. Um, and then very quickly, we decided to offer our staff the opportunity to volunteer at Gentle Hands. And so we paid for them to go for two weeks, flights, hotels, food, et cetera, and gave them two weeks holo extra holiday. And I think about half the company, people were pregnant or had pregnant wives. And so not everybody could go, but everybody who could go went. And um, we had four groups and they went as volunteer teaching assistants and they all came back and said it was life changing mm -hmm. that there is life before gentle hands and life after gentle hands uh, i was then invited uh, 2019 uh, to their thanksgiving um, dinner and they did a concert of ballet for the girls and taekwondo for the boys and discussed with Mark Rogers before I left, and we, we agreed that in the spirit of Thanksgiving, we would pay for all of the food for all of the children, three meals a day for the coming year. That's something we've continued to do and increase through COVID. Yeah. Um, so I went for one day to the Philippines uh, to see these children, and it was overwhelming sitting in a room uh, where 250 children are coming and going, but they are so desperate to be loved and, and get some attention. They were climbing all over me. We were playing. Um, and then you hear that that child is the, is the, Product, product of incest. And all of them, all, almost all of them, have been sexually abused, boys and girls. And these are smiling, happy, laughing, playful children. So, can we do more? Yes, we can do more. Yeah. Um, yeah. We then, I then went with my colleague Joe Swords to Ethiopia. Uh, we wanted to find another charity to support. Um, we do business in Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, and by chance, my wife met a lady in Dubai who had adopted two Ethiopian children. So we asked her for an introduction, and she introduced us to a lady called Karen Kendall. Karen was a fancy Dubai based lawyer, Australian lady. And she went on business to Addis Ababa. And while there, she was brought a girl who had been thrown into a bush that eats your flesh to die because her mother couldn't, uh, you know, I don't judge that, it's desperate and it's awful, but she could have been 13 years old and raped, you know, we, I don't know that. And yeah. so the poor child was thrown into this bush and, uh, Karen found out about this. She paid for her medical 
treatment. And she grew closer and cl closer to Ruby during this time, and she adopted her. Wow. It's a long process to adopt a child. Yep. It, anyway, really. Yeah. Um, and um, during that time, Karen found that this was not a unique thing. There were many children who things like this happened to. Uh, so Joe Swords, our sales director, and myself went to Ad Addis Ababa, and we met with Karen and another angel who just gave everything of herself to helping others, gave up a job, moved to Ethiopia, opened an orphanage to take these children. I held a child when I visited Shamida, which is the, the charity, Shamida Ethiopia. Yeah. I held a child who they took from a toilet where its mother had tried to flush it down the toilet. It's the 21st century. Yeah. So again, we provide all the food, we pay for all the food, for the staff and the children. Uh, for both um, orphanages, we uh, have a collection among our staff at Christmas, <clears throat> and then the company matches the amount of money, and we get a Christmas present. Uh, we allow $50 per child at the two orphanages. And um, yeah, we'll, for, we'll forever do that. Uh, that's uh, an important thing for our staff and an important thing for the owners and for the company as a whole. Um, yeah, and look, this is really important that you're using the present tense, we pay, not we paid. I, I read a lot about these charities when I interviewed with you. You once told me, you know, once a company makes a serious commitment, to help children who are literally dying of hunger, it's not possible to stop. And I think, and you also told me we must be successful. So you brought your winning mentality from business um, to these charities. For everyone who's listening and no doubt is pretty moved by these stories, we will feature alongside this podcast with Patrick um, a video on Kids for Kids. Um, some background on Gentle Hands, just an amazing, an amazing organization. And of course, Shamida, Ethiopia as well. So you'll see, you'll see a video there. I urge you to, to watch them as well as this podcast, because they're very, very important indeed. Any final word on that area before we move on? We change no, time. Just the, fi the, the final thing that we did, we opened in Miami in uh, 2020 to... to yep supply American embassies around the world with a taste of America. And we thought we should follow what we've been doing. Um, I've got a good friend, uh, a guy called John Pillard, who was Haiti's ambassador to London. Um, and we, we had a good connection. And he started an organization called Life Skills Haiti. Yep. And they support young people to take on a profession or not be living in poverty, but not give them money, but train them for something else. Uh, we, Jean asked me to become uh, on the board of advisors. So during that conversation, when he asked me, we talked about many things. And one of the things was a program to train nurses, but it was, uh, I think $1,500 per nurse to train for a year. And if you're poor and your family's poor and you live in Haiti, where do you get $1,500 from? Yeah. Uh, so we committed to um, funding 10 nurses from the beginning. And then my wife's company, Drink Dry, which is a company based in Dubai, yeah. drinkdrystore.com, um, uh, funded two nurses. Um, and then we set up a program when an American embassy spends $100,000 with us, with one order or five orders or 10 orders, we will pay for another nurse and we will invite the embassy to also pay for a nurse. And if they do, we'll match them and pay for yet another one. So for every time $100,000 is spent with us from our Miami business, we could fund um, three nurses. So that program continues and is doing really well. 
the new yeah. term will start in August, and we've just uh, committed to further payments. Um, we've had some lovely feedback, incredible feedback from, from young ladies who have been through the first year and we're going into the second year and the opportunity it's given them not just to themselves but to feed back to their community that Haiti's been through some awful times yeah. and they're able to help the sick and, and needy so yeah it's good. Yeah yeah I've spent a lot of time in Haiti uh, as you know um, visited the country first after the 20 10 earthquake we very involved with the many many people in the travel retail industry and building a world-class school there but the lesson of that exercise was that education of various forms was so important to empowering people to escape the poverty trap and to and to bring other benefits to the society and that's exactly what's going on with life skills haiti and the funding of these scholarships again um patrick we will highlight that um to all our listeners um in this story i think it's extraordinary what what you're doing and we should all salute you for it i'm going to change tone now and we're going to have a bit of fun as we always do with our guests i'm going to hand over to to roger uh, we do have a resident desert island to take you Patrick, it has duty-free rights, of course, you would expect that from us. So Patrick, um, over to Roger, and he'll tell you about a few creature comforts we're going to give you. Um, so Patrick, on your desert island, uh, the first thing you're allowed to take with you is one duty-free item. Uh, it can be anything you want. Um, so which item would you take? And I guess IDS are delivering it, so you've also got diplomatic status. <laughs> Oh, do I? Well, as you know, I don't drink and I don't smoke. Um, and I'm only going on the desert island if my wife can come with me. So my purchase is going to be a bottle of Chanel Mademoiselle Eau de Parfum for Erica. Uh, and that's my purchase every couple of times I pass through an airport. And I just bought some in Belgium a couple of weeks ago. Very no good. problem. So, and of course, Erica's invited. I don't think she would forgive me if uh, <laughs> that, that was the case. Um, the second thing is, which I'm sure you do consume, is what piece of music or album uh, would you bring to the island with Erica? This is difficult. Um, I love music, but I'm stuck in a kind of mid 80s time zone. So, my choices would be. And I, and I do have a final decision, but uh, you two, Joshua Tree or Acton Baby, but my final decision is not one of those. It's The River by Bruce Springsteen. Oh, great song. I'm, I'm desperate to get tickets to see Bruce Springsteen in Europe anywhere uh, next year. He's touring. Um, so, yeah, The River is uh, one of my all-time favorite albums and I can listen to certain songs just 10 times in a row yeah did you did you see him at Glastonbury no I didn't I didn't oh, okay. I, I, I was traveling I just got back yeah you, love should, uh, you should look it up he comes on with Paul McCartney um so I think you'll enjoy yeah, it I heard. yeah uh, he's great and yeah. um so I want to see him We've got the perfume, uh, we've got your wife, Erica, we've got, got the music, <laughs> we've got Bruce. <laughs> um, what would you bring to read? Uh, what book would you bring onto the island? Um, do, you, do you get much time to read, Roger? Uh, no, I've got to be, all of my consumption of reading now is digital. I listen to, I listen right. to it. Yeah. Well, Roger's got a five-year-old daughter i've got a five-year-old a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old um so reading is unless it's bedtime books for the girls reading is a luxury that i really get to have erica bought me barack obama's uh, autobiography i like autobiographies about two years ago and i'm still on page 100 yeah. um so um but if I was going to get the time to read, 
I, I've always been really interested in Irish history. Uh, Tim Pat Coogan is a great uh, author on and, re and researcher on Irish history. So something from him on 1916 uprising or the troubles or any any period of Irish history from probably the 17th century onwards. That's what I would think. All right. Fantastic. Um, another Irishman, a famous Irishman in Dubai, gave me a very good book about Irish history, Patrick. That's Colin McLaughlin, um, the head of Dubai Duty Free. He gave me a book called The Hunger, yeah. which is um, the tale of the, you know, the great the Irish famine. famine. Um, extraordinary read. And Bruce Springsteen, well, well, well. I last saw him in San Sebastian, and it was the most unforgettable concert in my life. If I'd known he was on it, Glastonbury, is that Glastonbury that's just happened, Roger? That It is, yeah, yeah, it is. He surprised Paul McCartney, brought out a special guest. And, yeah, the, the crowd went crazy, as you can imagine, because none of them yeah. were expecting uh, Bruce Springsteen to come out. No, and here am I in the UK, and I missed him. Never mind. Um, yeah. Patrick, we're... We have allowed you to bring Erica, of course, so there's the two of you on the island, but now you're going to have a dinner party. We're going to, we're going to bring in three guests. Of course, they, they can be hypothetically from history or they can be people that are living today. Um, the most special guests you could possibly think of. We'll give you three. Who would they be and why? Well, again, tough one. It would have been easier to have a table of 10. Um, <laughs> So the first one would be Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I still listen to his speeches now for inspiration to face what he faced uh, with such dignity. Um, his, his spoken word, uh, he achieved a great deal. Possibly in his lifetime, he didn't realize quite what he achieved. Um, but uh, yes, Martin Luther King would be the first one with me. The second one, although I didn't bring his album, would be Bono. Uh, Bono is, uh, so I've, I've probably got every U2 album that they ever made. I've seen them many times, 10, 11, 12 times, I think. Um, and Bono would really like to have dinner with Martin Luther King because he's a hero of his yep. so that would be good he's also Bono's also from Finglas West which is uh where I was born in on the in the north side of Dublin okay so he'd be coming and my final guest would be Patricia Parker the founder of Kids for Kids hmm. uh you'd have to have somebody pretty uh strong in character and phenomenal to sit with Martin Luther King and Bono and me. Yeah. And Patricia would more than hold her own and probably be in charge. So that's who I'd have as my third guest. That would be a highly memorable dinner party indeed. All right, Patrick, well, you've been on the island long enough. We're going to take you off it now and we're going to fly you in um, style, in tripod style, first class, of course, Roger, isn't it? And uh, to anywhere in the world, somewhere that is right on the top of your bucket list for one reason or another, where would that be? And why would you choose it? Well, it would be Bora Bora. Okay. Er I, Erica has always wanted to go there. And as you're paying, and we're going first class, it seems like a good opportunity to uh, to go to Bora Bora. Okay. However, it is a hypothetical uh, choice because I just wouldn't and couldn't be that far away from my four children. So um, I wouldn't go anywhere unless my children are with me. And therefore, I would go somewhere close by and have them there. But hypothetically, Bora Bora with Erica. Uh, Bora Bora. Well, Tripod's a, a, a partnership, Patrick, between the SIVA Group and, and the Moody Davitt Report. So the Moody Davitt Report just introduces the question, but the SIVA Group actually pays for the flight. So that won't be a problem at all. You can bring the family along as well. Oh, thank right. you. That's so kind. 
That's so really kind. kind of you, Martin. <laughs> I hope Severino's not listening to this, Roger. I might no, be I trouble. hope he is. I hope yeah. he is. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you make that phone call, Martin. Uh, all right, good. Well, fantastic choice. Roger, uh, I'll let you have the final word, but uh, Patrick, I've so enjoyed chatting with you as I, as I always do. I'm always inspired by what you do and what you stand for and keep doing the amazing things you do for the world. And of course, may your business continue to flourish as it's flourished for a long time. May Erica's new business, um, which is going so well, uh, a drink dry, do, do, doing fabulously. May that continue to flourish as well, because you both deserve it. And uh, thanks for being with us today. Roger, over to you to close up. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the uh, podcast. As I said, I knew um, an awful lot already about you, but I've learned some new things. I think the only thing that I'll share, because I know you never would, without going into specifics, because I'm sure I would embarrass Patrick, the difference with Patrick versus a lot of other leaders in our industry and others is he follows this through personally as well. So he spoke very much around, you know, what IDS do, but without embarrassing Patrick, he does that himself. And he's never told me that. It's just as I've got closer to Patrick and his family, I, I, I've seen that firsthand. So yeah. you know, there's too many times you see people stand up and land the big message. And then as Patrick said, the year after the funding gets moved to somebody else or it stops. Yeah. And not only do IDS you know, keep with those charities and have seen that through for many years. Patrick does that and Erica do that personally as well. And um, to be close to that is very, very humbling, as I've said to Patrick many times, but it means an awful lot to see somebody not only saying the right thing, but actually when no one's watching, doing the right thing as well. Absolutely. All right, Roger. Thank well you very said. much. Patrick, take good care from both of us. Thanks for being on the programme. Thank you for asking me and uh, been very interesting, thought provoking for me. Very good. All right. Take care, Patrick. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Patrick. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Roger, phew, what a extraordinary tale. What a man, what values, what principles, what a will to win, what resilience, what a story, eh? Yeah, I think so. I think there's uh, probably only another, one other podcast that I can think of where I've uh, been left feeling like this at the end. You know, I think what Patrick describes of what he's seen and what he's come across, especially when you look at the, uh, you know, the CS initiatives, I think, um, and as Patrick said, it genuinely isn't an initiative for him. It is just how him and Erica yeah. and the family feel. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty shocked by some of the things that Patrick said. I'm going to go away and look a bit more into some of those things myself because it's, it's left some questions. Yeah. Um, but as I said to Patrick, and I'll say it again now, the great thing with Patrick away from business, obviously he's very driven, they've built a super successful business with their partners, yeah. is that Patrick follows this through himself. So he does it in the business, he does it himself, and he does it when no one's looking. I won't embarrass him because it's personal things that you know I've seen, but he really does, and not many people can genuinely say that. Um, so I'm really grateful, um, you know, to class Patrick as a friend, to be able to get to work with him, um, but also to have him on here as well was uh, was amazing. So yeah, I, I thought it was a great podcast. Yeah, well said. No, it was a privilege to talk to him. One of the understated people of our industry, but boy, what an achiever in every way. So it's been it's been a, a great episode. Roger, you take good care. I hope business keep, keeps um, growing your business and the business. Um, but in the meantime, to all our listeners and viewers, see you next time. See you next week.